Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Audrey Stewart, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to welcome you to tonight's event with Hermione Lee, presenting her new book, Tom Stoppard, A Life. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our new digital community during these challenging times. Our spring season is in full swing. Next week, Rebecca Solnit will be joining us, and later this month, Walter Isaacson. For more, make sure to check out our event schedule at harvard.com events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk tonight, go to the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. If you'd like to purchase a copy of Tom Stoppard, A Life, there will be a link in the chat where you can purchase. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you, especially during this difficult time for community spaces like your local bookstore. There will also be a link for donation in the chat if you'd like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases and financial contributions make this author series possible and now more than ever supports the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you so much for tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support, especially now. And as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings this past year, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as we can. Thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. Now, I am so pleased to introduce Hermione Lee. Hermione is the former president of Wolfson College and currently is Emeritus Professor of, of English Literature at Oxford University. Her works include biographies of Virginia Woolf, Edith Wharton, and Penelope Fitzgerald, which was the recipient of the James Tate Black Prize and was one of the New York Times' 10 best books of 2014. Lee was awarded the Biographer's Club Prize for Exceptional Contribution to Biography in 2018. She is a fellow of the British Academy and the Royal Society of Literature and a foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 20, 2003, she made a commander of the Order of the British Empire. And in 2013, she was made a Dame of Services to, liter to Literary Scholarship. Tonight, she's presenting her new biography on one of the most beloved literary figures of film and stage. Tom Stoppard brought us amazing works such as The Real Thing, Arcadia, The Coast of Utopia, Shakespeare in Love, and my personal favorite, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Now Hermione brings us the man behind the pen in this show-stopping biography. Before I turn things over to Hermione, I want to leave you with this quote from Harper's. This is an extraordinary record of a vital and evolving artistic life replete with textured illuminations of the plays and their performances and shaped by the arc of Stoppard's exhilarating engagement with the world around him and of his eventual awakening to his own past. And on that note of praise, I'd like to welcome Hermione Lee to the virtual stage. Hermione, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. So Hermione, much, how are you tonight? Thank you. And I'm very glad to be here at the Harvard Bookstore. I wish I was really in the Harvard Bookstore. Um, and thank you all for coming. I'm going to start my talk with an exchange about memory because memory plays such a, a fundamental part in the writing of a life. Uh, you'll probably remember this exchange from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Guildenstern, who's the bossy one, speaks first. Guildenstern, what's the first thing you remember? Oh, let's see. The first thing that comes into my head, you mean? No, the first thing you remember. Ah. No, it's no good, it's gone. It was a long time ago. You don't get my meaning. What is the first thing after all the things you've forgotten? Oh, I see. I've forgotten the question. When Tom Stoppard asked me to write his biography and I embarked on a series of conversations with him about his life, my opening question with that exchange in mind was, what's the first thing you remember? He answered a bit uncertainly, and uncertainty is one of his modes 
that he thought this was the first thing he remembered. He was aged three or four in Singapore in 1940 or 1941 with his brother and a group of Czech children and their parents. It was the Czech Christmas St. Nicholas's Eve. In Czech tradition, a man dressed up as a devil with a forked tail frightens the children and tells them to be good. And then every good boy and girl get present. Stoppard thinks his might have been a tin boat. At this time, his name was Thomas or Tomic Stroessler, and he would have been speaking Czech, which he would soon forget. They were a little group of exiles, war refugees and survivors in transit. This is one of his very few memories of being in Singapore. Another was being on a beach with his family. His father must have been there, but he couldn't remember his father. He had disappeared from memory. It was a long time ago. I've started this talk with that quotation and with that memory for several reasons. It takes us straight into the remarkable story of Stoppard's life. It puts into your ears that brilliant mixture of quick fire comedy and plangency in his work, which has provided one of the great pleasures of writing about him. And it opens up the intriguing relationship between a biographer and a living subject, which I'll come back to. I had no idea when I started work on this biography in 2014, and nor did he, that that question about first memory, so funny in Rosencrantz, would be asked again in a scene of deep anguish, grief, and guilt about the past in his most recent play, Leopoldstadt, after a 54 year span of writing. When we began our conversations, I said to me, you'll find I've had a very interesting life up to the age of eight. Well, that's not quite how it turned out to be, but I can see what he meant. This is the story of a childhood which between 1937 and 1946 moved dramatically from Czechoslovakia to Singapore, to India, to England. Eugen Stroessler, Stoppard's father, was a Jewish doctor in the hospital for the Bacher shoe firm in Zlin, a, a small town in Czechoslovakia, which was entirely built up around the Bacher shoe industry. The Stroessler's had to flee Czechoslovakia like hundreds of others, uh, for, for, and they went to Singapore uh, when the Nazis invaded in 1939. And then in 1942, the Japanese invaded Singapore. His father was killed. And his mother got away on a ship with her two little boys. It was a terrible, confused, awful journey. She actually thought they were going to Australia, but they ended up in India and they were taken care of there by the Basque community. His mother ran the shoe shop in Darjeeling, where the boys went to an American missionary school and spoke English. After she heard of her husband's death, Marta Stroessler remarried an English major, Ken Stoppard, who turned out to be a rather xenophobic and anti-Semitic character. He took his new wife and her two sons to England in 1946, where Marta Stroessler became Bobby Stoppard and Tomic Stroessler became Tom Stoppard. His mother, like many people coming out of wartime experiences, put her past firmly behind her. Above all, she wanted the boys to be assimilated and not to run into any trouble. She didn't speak Czech at home and she didn't talk to them about, her, about their father or about her own Jewishness or about what happened to their Jewish relatives. It's, it's an extraordinary, though not unusual, story of silence and concealment. So Stoppard, who re respected his, his mother's silence about her past, did not press her about her origins or her family or her Jewishness. He didn't find out until his 50s that many of his relatives, his father's parents and grandmother, three of his mother's sisters and both her parents had all perished in the Holocaust. It wasn't until 25 years after finding out those facts that he put a version of that story and of his own unknowingness of those facts into a play. All his life, he thought a great deal about luck and chance, subjects which get, which get into a lot of his plays. As a child, though his family were refugees and his father was killed, he narrowly escaped the Nazi regime in Czechoslovakia and the Japanese atrocities in Singapore. He left India before the terrible violence and mass displacement of partition. He avoided a post-war return to Czechoslovakia under communism, and he got to England after the wartime bombing. 
And so he described himself often as a lucky man with a charmed life. But he often thought about what the alternatives might have been. He gave an alternative version of his life story to the character of Jan in Rock and Roll in 2006, who does grow up in Soviet-run Czechoslovakia. And Jan's original name in the play was to have been Thomas. The luck of the draw, the road not taken, was obviously not something he thought about as a child, but it came to haunt him as an adult. What would that other Tom have been, the one who didn't become an Englishman? And become English, he certainly did. Once settled at his Derbyshire boarding school, which came to represent Arcadia for him, he, as he put it, put on Englishness like a coat. He would say, at the age of eight, I fell in love with England almost at first glance. Out of that childhood emigration and resettlement came a deep love of English customs, education, landscape, and traditions, including cricket and trout fishing. A patriotic gratitude, a pleasure in belonging to his adoptive country, a respect for democracy and free speech, and a satisfaction in being part of the English establishment with his knighthood and his order of merit, were the lifelong outcome of his childhood luck. He said in 2013 of his adopted Englishness, I wasn't merely safe, I was in the land of tolerance, fair play and autonomous liberty, of habeas corpus, of the mother of parliaments, of freedom of speech, worship and assembly, of the English language. I didn't make this list when I was eight, but by 18, I would have added the best and freest newspapers forged in the crucible of modern liberty and the best theater. As I grew up, I never had to put on a uniform except as a boy scout. As a journalist, I have never been censored or told what to write. As a citizen, I never had to fear the knock on the door. And these feelings explain his later political views. He was scornful, for instance, of the revolutionary left-wing movements of the 1970s, which thought of bourgeois democracy as a form of fascism. He was a supporter of Thatcher in her battles with the unions in the 1980s. And this marked him for many years as a right-wing playwright, though it should be pointed out that those right-wing views have shifted markedly in his later years. And by the 2000s, he felt that many of the English values and virtues he had grown up admiring and feeling grateful for had been diminished, corrupted, or come under threat. That story of Tom Stoppard's adopted Englishness is one of the key stories of my book. And there are plenty of other stories in this biography, which I can only really just touch on here, but I'm happy to to answer questions on them later. There's the story of his early life as a journalist in Bristol, which was really his university since he left school at 17 and went straight to work. And then in London as a struggling, hardworking, penniless, would-be playwright. And then there is, there's his astonishing overnight leap to fame and success at the age of 29 with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And after that, there's been half a century of work in, in different media. So how would I sum up the value and importance of that work? I think three words will do it. Language, feeling, knowledge. He's known perhaps above all for dazzling quicksilver comedy, brilliant play of words, speed of thought and velocity of speech. He has a gift for giving equal eloquence to all sides of an argument. He loves to break language apart and put it together again. One play, Dogs Are Pet, teaches the audience the nonsense language of dog as the play goes along. Another, Travesties, starts with an apparent gallimorphy of noise, Lenin speaking Russian, Joyce dictating Ulysses, Tristan Zara making up Dadaisms. Another, the invention of love has at its heart the translation of Latin poetry. And in another, the real thing, a playwright famously uses a to demonstrate the need for well-made language in playwriting. 
what we're trying to do, he says, is to write picket backs so that when we throw up an idea and give it a little knock, it might travel. This is a writer who works and works at perfecting a line. If you look at the manuscript archive in, in the Harry Ransom Center in Texas, there, there are hundreds of, there might be hundreds of versions for one speech in a play. And who thinks of true speech and true words, free speech and true words as sacred. But he doesn't take the artist as seriously as he takes the art as old Henry Carr says to Tristan Zara in Travesties, in one of those moments in a Stoppard play where the character seems to be voicing his own views. This is Henry Carr. When I was at school, on certain afternoons, we all had to do what was called labor, weeding, sweeping, sawing logs for the boiler room, that kind of thing. But if you had a chit from Matron, you were let off to spend the afternoon messing about in the art room, labor or art. And you've got a chit for life? Where did you get it? What is an artist? For every thousand people, there's 900 doing the work, 90 doing well, nine doing good, and one lucky bastard who's the artist. After praising plays like Jumpers and Travesties for their verbal dazzle, Theatre critics suddenly started realizing that, as they put it, Tom Stoppard had a heart, has a heart with the real thing, and then again with Arcadia, and then again with Leopoldstadt. But one of the things I've tried to get across in this book is that deep feeling has always been part of the work. Think of the sense of homelessness, helplessness, exile, bewilderment, and mortality that haunts Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Think of the wretchedly unraveling marriage between Dotty and George in Jumpers, closely based on his own unhappy first marriage. It doesn't make Stoppard's plays any less funny that they are also often about grief and loss and the passage of time. But there are also moving consolations, as the tutor Septimus says in Arcadia. We shed as we pick up like travellers who must carry everything in their arms, and what we let fall will be picked up by those behind. The procession is very long and life is very short. We die on the march, but there is nothing outside the march, so nothing can be lost to it. The missing plays of Sophocles will turn up piece by piece or be written again in another language. Ancient cures for diseases will reveal themselves once more. Mathematical discoveries glimpsed and lost to view will have their time again. I chose as the epigraph for my biography, the words of Hannah, the historian of romanticism in Arcadia. She says, it's wanting to know that makes us matter. Otherwise we're going out the way we came in. Stoppard has always been fascinated by knowledge, by learning and specialisms, how the mind works things out, how knowledge is acquired and put to use. He would read about mathematics or quantum, the quantum physics or chaos theory with the same kind of excitement that he might bring to reading about Wittgenstein or 18th century landscape gardening or Latin and Greek poetry. And this is the same person who adores popular culture from the goon show to Monty Python to the movies to rock music. He has a self-educated, voracious magpie appetite for an enormous range of different kinds of knowledge. The question for him is always, how can such complex specialist subjects be harnessed to a dramatic entertaining plot and also provide a way of thinking about human behavior? He likes yoking unlikely subjects together. He enjoys writing plays in which thinkers make sense of the world. He likes to show characters wondering if there is any order inside apparent randomness, like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern tossing their coins, or whether the unprovable can be proved, like George, the philosopher in Jumpers. He wants to know how new systems of thought come into the world and what kinds of people might think them. For me, as his biographer, 
this this often involved a very steep learning curve. Uh, I was in a constant state of self-education, trying to catch up with what he knew. And I must say, I felt more at home with Hausmann or 18th century landscape gardening or Isaiah Berlin's thoughts about 19th century Russian revolutionaries than I did with Fermat's last theorem or quantum physics. But that education was actually part of the excitement uh, of the work as well as one of the challenges. Another challenge was simply the extent of Stoppard's energy and the number of different lives he had. There was an enormous amount to fit in this book. And sometimes I, I resented the linear nature of writing. I wanted to be able to write like a sort of musical stage so that I could do eight things on the page at once. This is a family man, a three times married father of four sons, a man with a high level of social visibility with an astonishing range of friends and colleagues and an active public life and a person of amazing energy with a formidable level of production, even though he's always berating himself for getting distracted or not working quickly enough. As well as the plays, that one man production line includes radio, television, libretti, adaptations, and a lot of screenplays and film work, some very well known like Shakespeare in Love and some uncredited. It also includes his political work, political with a small p. When he started out, he was thought of as something of a dandy, an apolitical wordsmith with no commitments except to good art. But from quite early on, in fact, there was a shift to a much more political Tom Stoppard. That public commitment can be traced from the 70s onwards with his interest, more than interest, in Czech oppression under a totalitarian communist regime and his crucial friendship with Václav Havel, out of which came his remarkable plays about ethics, freedom and silencing, Every Good Boy Deserves Favour and Professional Foul. And there was his work on behalf of Soviet Jewry in the 1980s, and there was his involvement with Penn and Index on Censorship, and later his work for the Belarus Free Theatre Company. In the 1970s, Václav Havel was a kind of alternative self for him. He wrote in his journal when Havel was arrested in January 1977. Václav Havel, a playwright, whose mother didn't marry into British democracy, has been charged with high treason. The minimum sentence is 15 years. The crime has been to plead for the fulfillment of basic human rights as defined by various international agreements subscribed to by the Czech government. It's very difficult to continue writing about this in a coherent way. One's responses crowd each other out. His Czechness and my Havel-like predilections as a writer single him out from the battalion of persecuted writers on my conscience. I sit here in this beautiful room surrounded by the commonplace luxuries of a successful writer and can hardly bring my mind to bear on Havel's present surroundings and on his prospects, his mental state. Could I contemplate a life where all can be preserved by moral cowardice, lost by moral courage. This society is maligned and attacked for its shortcomings. It must seem like paradise to a Czech or Russian artist. A few years later in 1984, when Havel was still under house arrest, Stoppard wrote him a moving letter. He says, I'm feeling rather conscious of you today for a very peculiar reason. I dreamt last night that I had been sent to jail, I don't know why, for three years. My dream was about my first day in jail. I was in terrible despair about being there and in my dream hoped it was only a dream but knew it wasn't. Then one of my children woke me up when he was going to school. And after the first moment of relief that I wasn't in jail, but merely in bed, I immediately thought of you and how frightful it must have been when there was no possibility of waking up and finding yourself at home.
One of the great advantages of working on a living subject was that I was able to see and to quote that journal entry and that letter. But what was it like? Otherwise, you will probably be wondering to work on a living subject in contrast to all my previous books. You can't write a biography of Tom Stoppard without being aware of his view of the genre. Some of his least appetizing characters are biographers like the dishonest show-off Bernard in Arcadia or Pike, the nitpicking nosy editor and would-be biographer of a woman poet in Indian Ink. A wise old lady in that play says, biography is the worst possible excuse for getting people wrong. In The Invention of Love, Stoppard's play about the poet Hausmann, Oscar Wilde is made to say of biography that it is the mesh through which our real life escapes. So I approached my task with some trepidation, but Stoppard was not like Samuel Beckett, who told his first biographer, I will neither help nor hinder. He made crucial materials available to me, like that journal and like the hundreds of letters which he wrote to his mother every week of his life from about 1948 to the year of her death in 1996, where he would give her regular updates on, on what she was doing, um, what he was doing so that she could keep pace with his life. I mean, he doesn't tell her everything because she's his mother, um, but it is an extraordinary form of a, a kind of diary. And when I vividly remember when these letters turned up, some time after I'd started work, actually, and they turned up in a big box and they were pretty much all undated. So I had to spend quite a lot of time dating them and then putting them into the narrative. But they were an absolute treasure trove. Um, and we had many long conversations in which nothing was off limits. He was prepared to answer all my questions. And he put me in touch with a lot of his friends and family and colleagues, and I found my own way uh, to many more. Of course, I knew that I would have to, to take what they said, sometimes with a pinch of salt, or be a little bit wary of what they were saying, since they were aware that he might be reading what they said about him in my book. One very exciting and revealing form of access uh, for me was the chance to watch him in rehearsal, uh, twice with new productions, The Hard Problem in 2015 and Leopoldstadt in 2020, uh, and twice with revivals, Travesties in 2016 and Rosencrantz in 2017. And I was very struck here by seeing his politeness and deference to the directors, his flexibility, uh, his admiration for the actors, and for the revivals, his willingness to make changes in now classic texts. As he often says, theater is an event, not a text. Um, I was especially struck by that in the 50th anniversary revival of Filmstone by, by David Laveau at the Old Vic. Um, most of the cast of this revival, including Daniel Radcliffe as Rosencrantz, were probably not even, were, were not born. Um, when Rosencrantz was first produced. Yet here was the legendary distinguished playwright, 50 years on, sitting every day in the rehearsal room, responding to queries from the young actors about what the play meant, um, and rather to their amazement, willingly making little tweaks, little, little changes. There's no such thing for him as a sacrosanct classic text. So for instance, he dropped in a few more bits of Hamlet uh, to uh, a few more bits of Shakespeare to ease the transition between the Hamlet scenes. And only now did it strike him that perhaps Gertrude could have a couple more lines. Stoppard said to me early on in our working relationship that he envisaged it as being like parallel lives. I would be writing his life and he would be living it. And part of that, of course, involved his carrying on writing. So Instead of ending the book where I thought I was going to end it with his 80th birthday, which had seemed to me a neat way of coming, coming to a conclusion, I found myself adding another chapter to the book in order to write about Leopoldstadt, his most recent play, which went dark a year ago because of the pandemic and which we all hope will return to the stage when theatres reopen. 
This was also a remarkable moment for me as his biographer because it returned me to his childhood and to that first question, what's the first thing you can remember? Which gets asked again in this play in a quite different tone. So I thought I'd end this part of the event by reading to you from the last chapter of my book, a passage which leads on to the way in which Leopoldstadt came into being. And after that, I'd be very happy to take questions. Time and again, he had talked about his good luck. He told people that he had had a charmed life and a happy childhood, even though he was taken from his home as a baby in wartime. His father was killed and many members of his family, as he later discovered, were murdered by the Nazis. This narrative had become part of his performance, his built-in way of thinking and talking about himself. And that story of a charmed life was profoundly connected to his sense of luck in having become English. A patriotic gratitude and a pleasure in belonging to his adoptive country, which in contrast to many other places was a free country, was the lifelong outcome of his childhood luck. A charmed life seems a highly appropriate phrase for him too, not that he would put it like this, because of his own charm. Charm is a difficult word. It usually makes a person sound shady, glib, superficial, manipulative. If it's possible to redeem the word, you'd want in his case to talk about deep charm, a charm that comes from attention, kindness, intelligence, humor, physical charisma, as well as glamor. And also charm as a form of concealment. It does work as a kind of defense and a means of persuasion. He knows what effect he has on people. Charm is also a vital characteristic of his work. And charm, in its sense of spell or enchantment, like the charms that Prospero says goodbye to, having set Ariel free at the end of the Tempest, is the secret of Stoppard's profession, the magical thing that happens in the theatre. It's hard to say quite how or why. It's a mystery. But his sense of having had a charmed life had its dark side too. Luck, the fall of a coin, plays a big part in his plays. Some of his characters get away with it and get lucky. They escape the war to the blessed zone of Swiss neutrality. They visit an oppressed Eastern European country but are free to go home again. They find the person they love at the very end of the play by accident or coincidence. But there are many characters who don't have any luck. They don't know who they are or what they are supposed to do. They are uncertain and confused and they never get any answers. They are far from home in exile with no hope of return. They do not get their heart's desire. They do not escape the worst of history. They die bewildered or too soon. As he came into old age, his sense of his charmed life underwent a retrospective shift. Of course, there had been profound changes before that. His thoughts about his own history and the way he used it in his work had been altered by his friendship with Havel by finding out facts of his Jewishness and returning to Czechoslovakia in the 1990s and by his mother's death. But in his 80s, the past came back for him in a different way, entailing some pain and self-reproach. He was a person and a writer for whom kin and kinship had always mattered deeply a family man. And he was thinking more and more about his kin, his family history and the responsibility he owed it. He had rethought many times what it meant to be Czech, to be an Eastern European child turned Englishman. Now, as can happen in old age, his history and his family's past became increasingly a preoccupation. What had once been obliterated came back to haunt him. That's beautiful, Hermione. Oh my. Um, thank you so much for giving that reading. Um, do you mind taking some audience questions? No, I'd be happy to. Wonderful. If anyone watching tonight would like to ask a question, click on the Q&A button on your screen. All right, we have a few. Let's get started. Uh, this one is from Ed. He asks, does Leopoldstadt reflect a different perspective on assimilation for Stoppard? 
It, that's an interesting question. Uh, historically, Leopoldstadt is not, uh, it's not autobiographical. Um, mm. And Stoppard is not actually a, a, an autobiographical confessional kind of playwright in the manner of someone like John Osborne. He doesn't let his feelings pour onto the, the stage. But the history of Leopoldstadt uh, is that of the, um, the assimilated Jewish families who had intermarried, uh, who were part of the Viennese society. This is set in Vienna, um, as the title suggests. Uh, they, uh, they, many of them converted, uh, they married out. Um, uh, they wanted to be part of high society. They made a lot of money, some of them. Um, they wanted to belong to the jockey club and have their portraits painted by Klimt uh, and go to the latest schnitzler plays. They thought of themselves as Viennese. Um, uh, there's a very, there's a lot of humor in this tragic play. And there's a funny scene at the beginning where Christmas is being celebrated with a star of David on the top of the Christmas tree. Um, and that's part of what's going on in that, in that family. And as the play goes on, um, Stoppard had drawn very heavily as he always does, his reading is always enormous for his plays. He had drawn on the stories of um, families such as Edmund de Waal's family or um, the Wittgensteins. He'd drawn on the picture of Stefan Zweig. He'd drawn on a lot of Austro-Hungarian and Viennese writers. There's a particularly powerful scene in the memoir of the Wittgensteins where Paul Wittgenstein on, on the day of the Anschluss or the day after the Anschluss comes in to see his sister and he's as white as a sheet. And he says, we count as Jews. And that's all they count as from then on. So this play, which proceeds by leaps from the early 20th century to 1955, turn of the century to 1955, shows this family being utterly destroyed. Um, one of the three surviving members of the family who are reunited in the last scene of the play had got take rescue taken to England as a small child. His mother has been killed in the Blitz. He, he's become a writer and he comes back to Vienna in 1955 for a writer's conference. And he's a rather smug, self-satisfied, very English young man who doesn't remember the childhood that he's had that we've witnessed in the play. And it's only by meeting these two surviving relatives, both of whom are very angry with him or not knowing his own past, that he comes to remember. And that coming to remember is a kind of restitution in a way that happens at the end of, at the, end of the play. And one of the characters says to him, nobody's, nobody's life, I'm slightly misquoting, nobody's life starts at the age of eight. And of course, the age of eight is when Stoppard arrived in England. And he told me when we were talking about the play that he had written the play in order to put that line into it. I see. Wow. That's kind of amazing. Uh, we have a, a follow up question um, that I think relates very well. This is from Thomas. Um, the opening chapters of your book contain a moving account of the deaths of Mr. Stoppard's grandparents and other relatives in the Holocaust. It seems that Stoppard never learned anything about the fate of these people from family members with whom he and his mother were in touch after the war. Um, Thomas is interested in what Mr. Stoppard told you about his contacts with surviving relatives. Yes, uh, indeed, I met the surviving uh, mm. relatives and, and talked to them also about their exchanges with, with Stoppard in the 90s about this. Um, so as I said in my talk, uh, he, he was obedient to his mother's desire not to talk about her past. And uh, when he would ask her if they were, if she was, he knew his father was Jewish and he knew his mother was Jewish, but she didn't make a thing about it. And when he would say, are we Jewish? She would make a sort of tsk, a sort of little tsk noise of irritation as though the question irritated. And he knew what that meant, that for her, Jewish meant a religion. It didn't mean a racial inheritance. She thought of Jewish as the Orthodox Jews that they would see in Zlin, um, wearing their, their their habits. Um, and she, she was an atheist. 
uh, she was a secular person. She didn't think of herself as Jewish. And so when he became famous and he went to New York for the first time, it being New York, of course, everybody asked him if he was Jewish. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm Jewish, which was a joke he'd stolen from Jonathan Miller in Beyond the Fringe. Um, and that was sort of his attitude. And, and, and then as he became involved, for instance, in the case of Soviet Jewry uh, in the 1980s, the Soviet refusenics, he he became increasingly aware of his mother's real anxiety about this and her sort of dread that he might run himself into any danger, um, any anti-Semitic rebuffs. Uh, and there's the, among the letters to her, there's, there is an interesting letter saying, look, I, I know what you feel, but I, you know, why should I not put myself out there and help such people? Um, this is this is a cause that I that I believe in. So it wasn't until after she died he met his cousin Sartre, who um, he she'd been corresponding with his mother, and they met actually at a in the interval of, in in a rehearsal for Arcadia at the National Theatre, and they were sitting at the restaurant table at the National Theatre, and um, and he said to Sartre, Sartre, are we Jewish? And she said. What do you mean? Of course you're Jewish. And she drew the family tree on a napkin at the restaurant table for him. And he asked her what happened to all these people in the family tree. And she said, Auschwitz, Theresienstadt. Uh, and that conversation became, was put into a piece that he wrote after his mother had died for a magazine called Talk Magazine in 1999 which was titled On Turning Out to be Jewish. I don't think that's the title he gave it. I think that was given to the piece. Mm -hmm. And he put that conversation in that piece. And then in 2020, he finally wrote the play in which that pretty much exactly that conversation takes place at the end of the Apostle. I don't think there could be a more powerful conversation that must have been impactful for him. Yes, uh, I also think that, that this, this question of silence, I'm, which I'm deeply interested in both sort of historically and also as a biographer. You know, we, we now, I think, feel that confession and telling your story and laying bare your soul and talking in public about um, what your feelings are is a kind of given or is a kind of good or is a valuable thing to do. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case. I have a lot of respect for silences. And I think Stoppard deeply understood, he's been reproached for not asking more questions, but I think he deeply understood why his mother and many people of that generation who themselves had obviously got survivor's guilt and had survived where others had not, chose not to talk about it. I don't think anyone can blame him. I think it's descriptive of a generation. We have a question from Anne. Does he have a point of view on which play had a biggest, the biggest cultural impact? Oh, that's a very interesting question. I thought you were going to say which which play did he like best? That's much easier to answer. <laughs> well, that's a you know what? I'd be curious to know that too. Yes, cultural impact. That's a very good question. And nobody's asked me that before. I think he probably wouldn't think in those terms. I think he mm. would wince. I think he would probably say, oh, you know, I don't think my plays have any cultural impact. I imagine would be would be his his answer. I think that um, Post of Utopia, the big nine hour three play epic about um, yeah, the, the, the roots of the Russian Revolution. Uh, which is something he's been interested in since Travis did. Um, I think he, I, I'm sure he wanted that to make people think very hard about, you know, the history of communism and what is wrong with utopian totalitarianism. What is wrong with with sacrificing the individual in the interests of the the ultimate common good. Mm. Um, <laughs> So I think that that play was close close to his heart. I mean, I think in terms of cultural cultural Im impact in terms of theatre, I think probably the most extraordinary of all the plays is Arcadia. And I think he felt that Arcadia 
as he sometimes puts it, fell out perfectly like a game of patience, um, <laughs> in the sense that, you know, that extraordinary yoking together of, of chaos theory and Fermat's last theorem and 18th century landscape gardening improvements and the poetry of Byron, um, uh, at all culminating in a heartbreakingly tender and touching love story. Um, in one room with two times going on where the quest for the past is part of the story. Um, you know, everything in the, in the 18th century world is rushing forward entropically as it were, and everything in the present world is looking backwards and trying to read the clues of the past and the pleasure and delight for the audience as they can see the ways in which the 20th century researchers are getting things wrong because we're seeing what's going on. That's such a, brilliant device. I can't think of anybody else actually who would bring all that together in that way. And I think in terms of sort of cultural artifact, you know, Arcadia, I think, will last as long as there are plays and theatres and readers. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's definitely true for literature that beautiful and, and just frankly enjoyable. Yes, it um, is very enjoyable. <laughs> we have a question from uh, Jessica. What was the most surprising thing you learned about Stoppard? Hmm. Well, there, there aren't sort of huge skeletons in the, in the cupboard, at least if there are, the skeletons have stayed in the cupboard and someone else will have to find them. I think there, were, I think there are two things I would say. Um, one is that I had seen him, I knew him very slightly before he asked me to do this job. And then I got to know him much, obviously, through these conversations. And I had seen him as this enormously famous, you know, brilliantly uh, gifted, very important contemporary playwright. Um, and once, you, you, you know, you see him everywhere in, in England. You, he's always at the theatre when there were theatres open. Um, and he, he, he's out and about, you know, he's, he's a big figure. In, in the cultural world and the intellectual world too. And what I hadn't quite realized was that this person is also quite private, quite embarrassable, quite shy in a way, mm -hmm. um, and ultimately very self-reliant, ultimately not actually needing other people. And I'm only saying what he has said Mm -hmm. I did a very interesting interview about him with David Cornwell, alias John McCarry, about two years before uh, Cornwell died. And they are intensely fond of each other and they got on extremely well. And Cornwell said to me that he felt there was, a, that he'd never talked to his part about this, but he felt there was a kind of darkness at the centre of this very ebullient, gregarious, funny, outgoing person and that he shared that and recognized it and I didn't I didn't I didn't go any further I didn't uh, I didn't push it you know I just felt that it was a very interesting and suggestive statement so that was one thing that was interesting and surprising and the other thing I think is simply because of these letters to his mother which she had kept and then were eventually returned to him and which I then read um, much much later long after they'd been written this was a surprise to me. I hadn't realized that the mother was going to turn out to be such a central character in this story. I'm kind of surprised hearing that myself. Uh, we have a question from Kenny. Kenny says, thank you so much for your work. And you. um, Kenny says, I know you've written about male writers before, but did you feel a different sense of obligation to portray this charming man in a certain light? Yes, it's, this will seem like a sort of, sort of evasive answer, but when I set out to do this, um, having written biographies of women novelists before, dead women novelists before, um, the challenge to me formulated itself not as, oh gosh, now I have to write about a man, I didn't even think of that actually. The challenge for me was much more, oh, now I have to write about a living person. And mm -hmm. now I have to write about a playwright. And I'm, you know, I've always been very interested in the theater um, and interested in his work, but I'm not a 
of a fully paid up theatre person. I'm not a theatre reviewer. I hadn't written books about the theatre. So I wasn't a sort of natural, obvious choice for this. And I think one of the reasons he did ask me to do it was probably because I'm a literary biographer. And I think that, you know, I think that's what he, uh, I think that's what he wanted. Um, so I didn't really formulate it as thinking, here is this man that I've now got to write about. How do I reconfigure my write, my writing nature in order to write the story of a man? It just didn't occur to me. I just wrote about a human being who's also kind of genius, I think. Fair enough. Uh, we have a question from Eddie. How does he reconcile the challenges that immigrants had in the UK, including Eastern European Jews, as well as those from parts of the former colonial empire? And also, what about Megan's treatment? And that's referring to Megan Markle, I believe. Oh, I did. Yeah, I wouldn't want to say anything about that. Um, I'm not quite sure that I understand the question. Um, I, I mean, certainly he, he didn't match his own childhood experiences as someone who had left um, Eastern Europe and then gone on this extraordinary sort of world tour before the age of eight. I don't think he consciously mapped hit that experience onto the experience of, say, Soviet Jews wanting to get out of Russia uh, in the 1980s. Um, but I think he does in his work and in his, um, in his political commitments, his public social commitments, I think he has a very strong feeling as I try to express in my, when talking about Havel, um, uh, for people who are not leading free lives for, for, whatever, for whatever reason. Um, and I think it's that sense of, you know, not being able to be free to speak out and to live the life you need to live. That is something that moves him very much. I, think. Mm, I see. Uh, we have a few more questions. There's a lot of questions. I'm so sorry, everyone. We're not going to get to all of them, but I'll get through as many as we can. Here's a question from Marcia. What is uh, Stopper's opinion of Joseph Conrad? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think he likes Conrad. We've never had a conversation about Conrad, actually. I, that's something I've missed. <laughs> but he, he's extremely interested in modernism. I mean, the early 20th century modernists, and I think Conrad would fit in there. He's actually one of his favorite writers, and this is as another surprise for me when I found this out, is Hemingway, um, whom he collects and writes about and has uh, had for many years a, a real passion for Hemingway. He's also, mm -hmm. you know, prof very much influenced in his early writing years by Eliot and by other American writers such as Arthur Miller um, and, and Steinbeck and Cummings. So there's a very strong feeling for those writers. Um, and also, uh, you know, I suppose the closest he gets to Conrad in his own writing life is through Ford, Ford Maddox Ford, who was, of course, mm -hmm. a collaborator with Conrad and a very and a, a good, a close friend of Conrad's, and they had a lot in common, and they worked uh, together in lots of ways. And and um, Stoppard spent a lot, several years, doing an absolutely brilliant adaptation for the television of Parade's End, Ford's long and complex wartime novel. Um, and some of the problems and challenges that he faced in that adaptation with the very complex and tricky way that Ford will slip from one point of view to another and from one time zone uh, to another um, uh, is not unlike, I'm sure, what it would be like to adapt something like Nostromo or Victory. Um, but I must ask him about Conrad. <laughs> Follow-up email for Tom. Uh, here's a beautiful question. Uh, the discussion of silence is so moving. Uh, when writing your previous biographies, did you view those inevitable gaps in information, the things you didn't know or couldn't know, as forms of silence? Yes, that's such a good question. And I'm, I've am i written a little book about biography called A Very Short Introduction to Biography, um, which 
which thinks about this whole question of the sort of gaps and uh, lacunae in biography. I'm not the kind of biographer that, that wants to sort of smooth things over and create hypotheses or possibilities where I don't know something. I would rather show the gaps or say what I don't know. Um, and yes, in writing about uh, Penelope Fitzgerald, who's a wonderful English novelist, um, uh, I felt there were lots of secrets and silences and she's a very evasive writer uh, and a pretty evasive person too, who would lie to her interviewers depending on how she was feeling. Um, and uh, you know, there were lots of things about Penelope Fitzgerald. I'm sure I never found out, and good for her. You know, I, <laughs> I quite like that battle between the subject and the, and the biographer. And with Wolf, you know, one of the things about biography is that it's not a free zone. You're at the mercy of the archive and the witnesses and what you can actually find and read. So if there's a whole missing tranche of letters, for instance, as there was with the uh, from Wolf's beloved brother Toby um, who died young was the model for Jacob in Jacob's room and Percival in in the waves I couldn't find any letters I, you know for ages I couldn't find any letters from Toby and then I went to see the venerable Quentin Bell Virginia Woolf's nephew and and his wife Anne Olivia Bell who edited the diaries and I said where are the letters from Toby and Olivia said to me they're in the attic <laughs> she'd been waiting for me to notice that they were missing you know I had to sort of prove my credentials as a, as a biographer before she was going to show them to me and that's a that's a little example of how you you really at the mercy of what you find if if Stoppard had not decided that he was going to let me see his letters to his mother this would have been a very different book well I think that just shows your power as a biographer uh well, it's <laughs> luck. <laughs> well, you're very lucky then. How's that? Here's, um, I think we have time for one more. Was Stopper's mother's English language sufficient to understand her own son's brilliance? Yes. She's an intelligent woman and you see her, uh, um, uh, you see through his letters to her, you can see how she has responded to his place. She went to all the productions uh, he often sent her the plays in advance. Um, she, you know, she she acquired very good English. I mean, she read newspapers all the time. She she read a lot. You know, this is not a sort of this is not a mismatch. This this is a this is an intelligent woman. Well, that's wonderful to hear. Um, I'm just going to ask a personal question for myself. Do you have a favorite of his work? Do I have a favorite? A, a favorite uh, piece of his work would uh, oh favorite a favorite play, play. yes um, actually I think my favorite play is also his favorite play although that's not why it's my favorite play um, I'm particularly fond of the play invention the invention of love uh, which in which the old poet A. E. Hausman on the banks um, of the river Styx meets um, uh, meets the young houseman who is hopelessly, hopelessly in love with the young man uh, he's he's at Oxford with, um, and out of which he writes his uh, wonderful poems. And um, there's a split in his personality between the dry, belligerent Latin scholar and teacher and the romantic, heartfelt, vulnerable, thwarted love poet. Uh, so there's a sort of double split in the in the play between those two sides of Hausman's nature, between Hausman and Wilde, who have a totally invented encounter in the middle of the play, and between the old Hausman and the young Hausman. And I find it an intensely moving play, actually, about time and mortality. There's a wonderful exchange with Karen, the, the rather comical river boatman who ferries people across to the to the underworld, um, and. He's telling the story of how there have always been, you know, mythological heroes who've tried to go to the underworld and bring back their beloved back to life. And Karen mm -hmm. says, but it can't be done, sir. It can't be done. Oh, wow. Well, Hermione, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. 
Unfortunately, we are out of time and apologize to everyone at home who asked questions that we just didn't have time for. This conversation could go on for another few hours and I think we'd all still have more questions, but um, I know I'm going to finish the night by seeing if my roommate wants to watch Shakespeare in Love with me. Right thank after you. <laughs> thank, I'd, like to, I'd just like to say thank you so much for, for running this session so well and, and enormous thanks to the audience. I'm really sorry that I can't see your faces, but I'd also uh, like to um, express a personal thanks to my publishers, Knopf, who are doing such a wonderful job with this book in, in the state. So thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you. And again, for supporting authors, publishers, indie book selling, and the incredible staff at Harvard Bookstore. Um, if you're watching tonight and you enjoyed the talk, check out the link in the chat. If you'd like to buy a copy of Tom Stopper to Life, uh, please remember to shop indie and shop local. From all of us at Harvard Bookstore, have a wonderful night. Be well, stay safe, and happy Monday. Thank you again, Hermione. Have a good night.